recorded in the beautiful mountains of British Columbia. Welcome to Friends, Friends on, on Horses. Horses. <laughs> Welcome back to Friends on Horses. Today we get to talk genetics with horsewoman, equine geneticist, and the director of the UC Davis Veterinar Veterinary Genetics Laboratory, Rebecca Ballone. Rebecca teaches and lectures on genetics. And today we hope that she will help us civilians learn a little bit about what genetics are and why they're important. We are excited to introduce Rebecca. Welcome, Rebecca. Thank you, and thank you so much for this amazing opportunity. I'm very excited to, to help talk a little bit about genetics, so. Well, and I'm wondering if we can start just maybe right at the beginning, and um, how did you become interested in equine genetics? Um, it's gonna sound a little bit like a joke, but um, it involves organic chemistry, a cow, friends, a great professor, and a not so great professor. <laughs> um, so I uh, was 21 and I took uh, organic chemistry in the summer and it was the same time I was taking genetics and the not so great professor was my organic chemistry professor. Uh -huh. and I really was struggling with organic chemistry and I thought I wanted to be a physical therapist but I needed to get a good grade in organic chemistry in order to get into physical therapy school. And at the same time, I was taking genetics, and I was just so fascinated by genetics. Mm. Um, and then a friend of mine took me out to her farm where a cow licked me and ate a grapefruit out of my hand, and I decided that I didn't want to be a physical therapist anymore. <laughs> I wanted to be a farmer. <laughs> so, um, so I switched my major to agriculture, and then I took a course called Genetic Improvement of Domesticated Farm Animals, and that's where the great professor comes into play. And um, he, during that course, we learned about cattle, we learned about dogs, we learned about horses, but he started touching on horses and coat color, and I just became really fascinated by that. Um, and he put up a picture of an Appaloosa horse and said, we don't really understand how this is inherited. And I naively thought, oh, I'll just go to graduate school and figure that out. Um, and what I mean by naively is I went to graduate school and earned a PhD on what genes don't cause Appaloosa spotting. <laughs> uh, but uh, my nature is persistent. So uh, we persist on and uh, several years later, we discovered the genetic cause of Appaloosa spotting. So um, that's sort of how I got into it. And, you know, um, part of the reason for going to graduate school, in addition to wanting to solve that puzzle, was... Um, I was really inspired by that great professor, Dr. Tim Olson, and I wanted to be like him in terms of helping to inspire undergraduate students to, you know, figure out what they were passionate about and help them find their way to get there. So, if if only more people had, um, you know, so many people are impacted by great teachers, right, and professors. If only more people had those kinds of experiences, that it inspires some wonderful work to take place. Hey. Yeah, um, I'm really, really grateful to him and uh, also grateful to one of my PhD advisors, Dr. Ernie Bailey, who was, you know, really instrumental in helping me find my way and navigate graduate school and um, continues to mentor me throughout my career. So, hmm. yeah, it's important. It's That's important to find your passion and, 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 you know, work closely with those people that help you get to where you want to go. That's wonderful. Now, for our, our listeners who may not... Um, have the experience in genetics that you do. <laughs> uh, could you give us a brief overview about uh, kind of what genetics are and maybe explain some of the terminology that may be helpful for, um, for people to get through this podcast? Sure. So genetics um, is a subdiscipline of biology that is particularly concerned with how traits are characteristic or passed down from one generation to the next. Um, and so really, if you think about it in um, simple terms, we're, as geneticists, we're interested in figuring out how a particular, what we call a phenotype, or the physical makeup, um, is controlled by the biology, if that makes sense. And so um, some common words that we use when we talk about genetics um, are when we talk about modes of inheritance or how traits are inherited. So oftentimes we use the word dominant. And that just means that you need one copy of the version of the gene that causes the trait in order to see the phenotype or order to see the trait. Um, versus the other term that we use 
which is called recessive, which means you need two copies of that version of the gene in order to express the trait. Um, so if we think about an example, because I think examples are the things that really help people understand. Um, and I love coat color because it's very visual and people can see it and it becomes more tangible. So if we talk about the gene that causes chestnut horses, so chestnut horses have a red body and red points, um, that is a recessive trait in that um, horses that are chestnut, they have two copies of the variant form of that gene. So um, I, I think about genetics in terms of, you know, genotypes, right? So if we think about the genotype of a chestnut horse, they would have two little E's. One little E came from mom, one little E came from dad. But if we think about a bay horse, a bay horse um, is sort of the dominant expression of that. And so they would have at least one big E. Um, and so they only need one big E in order to be bay. Whereas a chestnut horse, which is recessive, they need two little e's to be chestnut. Uh, so that explains dominant and recessive. Um, other, other words um, that are often used is homozygous versus heterozygous. So if we go back to our chestnut example, a horse that has two little e's is said to be homozygous. Homo meaning same, zygous meaning zygote or embryo, right? So um, homozygous, two little e's, so two of the same version of the gene. Whereas if we talk about that bay horse, if that bay horse had one big E and one little E, that would be two different versions of the gene. So they would be heterozygous. Hmm. Um, and then oftentimes we talk about, uh, you know, we use the term mutation and variant synonymously. So that little E is actually a single DNA change difference from the big E. So we would say that's the mutation or the variant. Um, and so those are some key terms that you have to understand when you're thinking about genetics and you're thinking about genetic traits. Well, and I know a lot of us, um, even just in biology in high school, had a very brief overview and kind of an understanding of genetics um, from the human perspective. Um, I'm wondering, are there similarities between how we think about equine genetics and how we might have understood um, human genetics, even just from that kind of brief high school um, experience? Yes, yeah, so the um, basic principles that govern genetics are the same. So um, what you learned in high school about, you know, one copy of every chromosome came from your mom and one copy of every chromosome came from your dad, those principles still apply um, when we talk about horses. Um, and, you know, I mentioned a word, chromosome. So what is chromosomes? Um, so, you know, the genetic material, the biological material that's inherited from one generation to the next is called DNA. And um, humans have about 3 billion bases of DNA that make up one set of chromosomes. Horses have about 2.8. Um, and that DNA, in order to fit inside the nucleus of the cell, has to be packaged tightly. So it, that DNA combines with proteins and gets packaged into structures that we call chromosomes. And it's those structures, those chromosomes that get passed down from one cell generation to the next. And so th those principles of biology and heredity are the same across um, all species. Um, but, you know, some other things that you might have learned in high school about uh, uh, humans, you might have learned about red hair in humans is recessive. Well, red hair in humans is recessive and red hair in horses is recessive. And it happens that um, red hair in humans is caused by mutations in the same gene that causes red hair in horses. Hmm. So much fun. I find this, I was particularly excited about your interview today, by the way. Oh, thank you. Yeah. That's I very kind. It, I find it so, so interesting. So I have a, um, I have a, a, a really goofy question, a silly question. That's okay. No such thing as a silly question. We'll see about that. Um, um, does it drive you crazy or do you find it interesting when you watch superhero movies like Spider-Man and, um, and Spider-Man uh, gets bitten by a spider and his, he, there's a mutation that takes place and he has, gets superpowers. Do you find, do, does that get your brain thinking about how that might happen or does, it, does the language drive you crazy that they use this language in their in, you know, yeah. 
Um, I, there's a part of it that does drive me crazy as a scientist. It, it's sort of like I, I could never watch the CSI shows because, you know, the PCR would be done in two minutes and they would have an answer. And, and I would get frustrated because I, I would feel like you're, you're teaching people a false way of how science gets done and it doesn't happen that fast. And we don't always get an answer with the, with the question that we're asking by the way that we're trying to answer it. Um, and so, yeah, I guess I get frustrated. There Don't watch My Little Pony. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, so how, how does a genetic uh, test work? Can you walk us through the process from, you know, from what a person has to do, uh, how they get their horse's um, genetics to you, and then what you do with that and look at? Sure. That's a great question. So um, first off, whenever we're doing genetic work, we have to start with DNA. So we have to get DNA from somewhere, right? And so DNA is contained within a special part of the cell called the nucleus. Um, so for us to do any genetic testing, we have to get a good DNA sample. And so from horses, most of the time we get hair samples. And so, um, you know, this usually intrigues people when they ask me like, where do you get the DNA from? And so <laughs> when they pull the horse hair at the end of the hair is the root, and that's where the cells that are actively dividing to make the protein that causes the hair are. And so we need the root in order to get the DNA. And so, so sometimes the, uh, people think, oh, we're getting the DNA from the actual hair itself, but, but we're getting it from the hair follicle, the root, because that's where the cells are that contain the DNA. So if someone were to send a sample that didn't have any roots, we can't get DNA from that sample. <sighs> So we have to start there. We have to start with some good material to get the DNA. And then we isolate the DNA. And then we have to, in order to determine what the, the genotype is or what, the, what variants are there for the particular gene we're interested in, we have to make billions of copies of that region of the DNA that contains the variant we're interested in looking at. <laughs> um, and so to do that, we use a process called a polymerase chain reaction. Um, so we isolate the DNA, we use a specific set of primers that flank the region that we're trying to amplify to make billions of copies of that region, and then we use one of several different detection mechanisms to decide whether it's this version of the gene or this version of the gene. Um, and so, uh, and what detection method we use depends on the kind of variant. So I talked about the variant that causes chestnut coat colors, a single DNA nucleotide change. Um, and so, and able to, to, to detect that single change, um, we could use one technology, but if we were talking about a variant that might be a very large insertion, like an uh, extra 1,000 DNA bases, we'd have to use a slightly different way to, to decide what are those two alleles that are there, or which of those two alleles are present, or which of those versions of the gene are present. Um, and then once we do that, um, in terms of genetic testing, there are several different mechanisms that go into play to, uh, that our laboratory uses to ensure the quality of the data. Um, and so then we have several analysts that look at the data and check the quality. So one example is for every test we do, we always run positive controls. And so if we're talking about a particular trait, like let's talk about the red factor that causes chestnut. Right? There are actually three alleles or three versions of that gene that we know about in horses. So there's the big E, there's the little e, and there's a little e subscript A. And so mm -hmm. when we run that test, we have to run controls that tell us if our test is working and we're able to detect all three of those alleles like we should. Mm -hmm. We would call those positive controls. But then we also have to run a negative control to make sure we don't have any contamination. And so that would be a sample that doesn't have any DNA in it. And if we get a result with that sample, we know, uh-oh, something went wrong, and we have to repeat the whole experiment. Hmm. So you're really cross-checking. You're making sure you're trying to get this as accurate as possible. We um, have a lot of steps in our pipeline that we, we really do as part of um, our quality control and our accuracy. Um, and that's one of the things that the Veterinary Genetics Laboratory really prides itself on, because we know that people are making decisions for their animals based on the results that we provide. And so we want to make sure we do everything we can to get them right. Well, and that flows um, kind of into my next question that I had for you, which um, was uh, why do um, some 
horse people come to you for testing? Like, why might someone want to get their horse tested? That's a great question. Um, and it's kind of a really long answer because there are lots of reasons. Um, one reason, and one of the things that we test a lot for, is for parentage verification. So some horse registries require parentage verification. So, um, you know, this is the pedigree and you say this is a sire and this is the dam. And we have a way to test um, that basically excludes um, or doesn't exclude the sire or the dam. Um, and that um, really began in the 1960s. Um, and it started with blood markers and not necessarily DNA markers. It moved to DNA markers in the 90s. But that was really a way to preserve the integrity of breeds. Um, and so a lot of horse breed organizations require parentage testing. Um, some require them for certain cases, but not for others. And so that's a, a, a one reason that people would test. Um, the other reason is that people use um, the uh, genetic report um, to make decision breeding decisions for the next generation. So whether they want to breed for a particular trait or breed away from a particular trait. So I'll give an example. Um, Friesian horses are mostly black, but every once in a while, there's a chestnut that pops up. And so, um, you know, they might test their mare for the chestnut mutation or the red factor gene to be sure that their mare is homozygous for two big E's and no little E, because then that way, if, if she's two big E's, she could never produce a chestnut horse. Um, so that's one way that they use it for selective breeding. Um, and that's an example of selective breeding away, right? But sometimes they want to selectively breed for, and so um, having a homozygous animal is um, advantageous to their breeding program. So uh, they're trying to identify um, homozygous animals that they can add to their breeding program, which is why they would test. Um, and then uh, some breed organizations require uh, disease genetic testing. So for example, the American Quarter Horse Association requires that stallions be five panel tested before their offspring can be registered. Um, and uh, another reason that, that people test, sometimes clinicians will test animals um, to confirm clinical diagnosis. So for example, um, I don't know, do you guys, are you familiar with uh, ovaro lethal white foal syndrome? So, uh, mm -hmm. Yes, please explain that though. That's quite interesting. So ovaro lethal white foal syndrome um, is a recessive disorder. So that means they need two copies of the mutated version of the gene in order to cause the trait. And what happens is with two copies of that mutated gene, the foal is born all white and dies soon after birth. And the reason why they die soon after birth is because um, there's another big word called pleiotropism, which means that a mutation in one gene can affect more than one system. So that mutation in the gene that causes ovarian lethal white foal affects melanocytes or pigment cells. And so that all white foal, um, basically those melanocytes didn't properly develop during embryogenesis. And so there isn't pigment, hence it's all white. But it also affects that same gene controls not only melanocyte migration, but it controls nerve cell migration. Mm -hmm. And so what happens in ovarian lethal white foals is that they don't get proper innervation to their gut. And so they can't digest food, which is why um, it's lethal. And so if an all-white foal is born and it dies soon, shortly after birth, um, sometimes clinicians will send us a sample from that animal to confirm that, in fact, it was caused by the ovarian lethal white syndrome. Hmm. And then other times um, breeders or, or animal owners, horse owners, test because they're trying to use it as a way to manage traits. So, for example, um, a dominant trait... Um, uh, HYPP um, causes, can cause periodic um, moments of muscle weakness. Mm -hmm. And so if a horse tests positive for that or they have a copy of HYPP, there are ways that they can manage that trait so that they minimize the risk of having episodes. So avoid feeds and high potassium, keep the horse on a regular exercise regime. And so in that case, ha um, doing genetic testing can help them make decisions on how to manage a trait. Um, question for you about that. So um, uh, that, is, that is something that I'm sure probably gets tested for 
mostly in the quarter horse world or is that something that can affect other breeds as well? Um, so um, the line where that mutation originated from was um, uh, basically released when uh, the mutation was identified. Mm -hmm. But so it's, it is mostly the quarter horse world, but then people breed other, other breeds breed to quarter horses. And so what we say is quarter horse and quarter horse related breeds. Ah. That's what, that's what we recommend, um, that test for that. Interesting. And good information for people who are, you know, say breed their quarter horse to something else or have a horse that is part quarter horse that they're looking to breed because it's a great horse. This might be a test that could be worthwhile getting done for them. Yes, correct. Hmm. Um, one, one of the things that I always say is that, you know, if you have a horse, it's important to know what are the genetic um, disorders that impact your breed um, and what genetic tests, it's important for you to know what genetic tests might be helpful or beneficial to you for managing and also for breed, breeding selection. Hmm. So it's so fascinating. Um, do you find there's one demographic that uh, gets tested more f or more frequently than than another, like uh, the racehorse people, like th th thoroughbreds? Who's doing the majority of the testing, or is it fairly well spread across the board? Um, well, like I mentioned, there are certain um, breeds that require parentage testing, right? Um, and then there are other different breed organizations have different genetic testing requirements. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, it really kind of is uh, breed dependent and requirement dependent. Mm -hmm. um, the majority of the testing we do do is for parentage, but we do a lot of coat color testing and a lot of uh, disease testing as well. Um, and most of the disease testing is sort of coupled around what, what are the breed requirements. Right, right. Is there anything that you feel you wish that people would be testing for more frequently? Anything that, that uh, you feel would have a, a positive impact on, on the horse industry? Mm -hmm. Well, um, something that I wish people would test more for is just, uh, it's because it's a study that I worked on, but um, several years ago we identified a mutation that um, increases risk for ocular squamous cell carcinoma in horses. Wow. So it's a, a cancer that they can get basically either on the third eyelid or on um, the, the surface of the eye. Um, and if it goes untreated, um, the cancer can grow and can cause big uh, vision problems for the horse. Mm -hmm. So this uh, risk factor we identified um, explains cancer, eye cancer in both Halflinger and Belgian breeds. Mm -hmm. um, and it's recessive. So what that means is that you know, you can have a horse that is heterozygous, so one copy of the normal version of the gene and one copy of the risk version of the gene, and not know that they can produce horses that are at higher risk. Interesting. And so if you have two versions, two risk copies of that gene, um, basically in our study that now has included um, over 100 horses, We've only identified one individual who was homozygous for that risk factor that did not get eye cancer by the time they were 20, um, when, when the horse was last examined was at 22 years old. Mm -hmm. um, and so how, how can animal owners and breeders use that test? Well, if their horse tests homozygous for the risk factor, they can manage it because that um, mutation is in a gene that basically repairs damage to DNA that's caused by ultraviolet light. So what we think is happening is that that mutation is making that protein that normally would go in, find the UV damaged DNA and fix it, mm -hmm. that it makes it so that protein can't find the UV damaged DNA and that damaged DNA doesn't get fixed and that leads to mutations in the DNA that then leads to cancer. So if a horse tests homozygous for that risk factor, what we recommend is that either you don't turn them out during peak sunlight hours or you turn them out with a UV protecting fly mask, thus minimizing the risk. So you can use that test as a way to manage the condition or reduce the risk of getting cancer. But you can also use that test if your horse is homozygous for the risk factor, you wouldn't breed it to another horse who's homozygous for the risk factor. 
right? Because then the only thing that's going to result at that cross are progeny that are homozygous for the risk factor. Mm. Instead, you could still breed that horse because it has all of the traits and qualities that you really like in your horse. You would breed that horse, though, to a horse that was homozygous for the wild type allele or a horse that did not have a single copy of the risk factor. And then in that cross, every time you would get a horse that's heterozygous or one normal version of the gene and one risk version of the gene, but that horse isn't at any higher risk. Hmm. Interesting. So, so, I mean, not just for this uh, specific issue, but even generally speaking, I, I would almost conclude, and, and correct me if I'm wrong here, because um, I don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> but uh, You're doing awesome. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> um, that um, that looking at um, at DNA, looking at genetics, can give us information about things that are that are sitting in our horses' bodies that aren't necessarily um, um, they're not conclusive. It can give you information so that you can think preventatively and manage risk. So. That's 100% correct. One of the things that we say about recessive traits, um, so we call an individual who, who has one copy of the recessive version, right? That recessive version, it's like you, you described as hiding in the genome, right? It's hiding in the DNA of the horse. Um, we call those individuals carriers. And they're not going to exhibit the phenotype, but they're carrying the DNA information to have the phenotype. And so um, that's uh, really for recessive traits. Um, genetic testing can be very powerful for breeding selection as well as um, thinking in terms of management. Good answer. So Good question. Like genetic testing can really impact um, breeding programs and just the decisions that breeders are making for their horses. Um, I'm wondering if you can speak a little bit more to that. Um, yes, and so I, I, again, I think that goes back to what I was mentioning a little bit earlier, is it's important to know, you know, for your given breed, what are the most important things that you should be testing for, what is possible to test for, and then also know what are some other, you know, diseases within the breed that maybe we just don't have a genetic test for yet or we haven't understood. Um, because then you're going to want to pay attention to, um, you know, the the occurrence of the phenotype in, in your breeding program, and and maybe you can't. We don't have a test for X trait yet, but you want to avoid maybe that same cross that, um, you know, produced the trait previously. Um, and then I'm going to go one step further, and then say, and then I encourage folks um, that you know have seen diseases in their herd. Um, to reach out to scientists to try to help, um, you know, contribute samples from their animals uh, to, to studies that are happening to try and identify these things. So yeah, genetic testing can be a very powerful tool to help breed away from or breed for those things that they want to produce. But I guess the other thing that I'm just trying to say is that we don't have the answers for everything. Mm -hmm. And um, there are a lot of genetic studies that are currently going on to identify additional variants. And so, you know, I just want to encourage people to partake in those studies um, and to help unravel um, genetic mutations. How might, um, how might someone um, partake in one of these studies? How do they, how do they find you? How do they go, how, when they go, hey, this horse, my horse has this interesting thing, people might want to know more about it or this might help contribute to, you know, research. Um, where do they go to get that information? That's a great question. Um, there are a couple of resources available. So if you Google something called Horse Genome Workshop, um, and it's just horsegenomeworkshop.com. So um, that is a, a good resource where there's a, a tab there that says Meet the Scientist. Mm -hmm. And um, it kind of uh, talks about you know, each of us that are involved in the equine genetics world and what are some of the projects that we're doing. Um, you know, we're, we're not a very, very large group. So, and we, we all work quite well together. So um, if they've worked with a equine geneticist before on another pro project, 
You know, I encourage them to reach out to them and say, do you know of anyone working on X disease? Um, and uh, that's another way to do it. But the horse genome workshop is, a, is a, a good place to start to see what scientists all over the world are working on and, and if there are any studies that they can participate in. Awesome. I'm curious about equine color genetics, and you kind of already laid the groundwork um, for this question, but I'm wondering if you could um, speak a little bit more just to um, how one might predict color um, in the horses that they're breeding. It's my favorite thing to talk about. <laughs> um, so as I mentioned, you know, that's really what got me into horse genetics is pigmentation. Um, and, and then over the years, um, I started to study ocular disorders because they're often um, tied to, to pigmentation traits. Um, but pigmentation is so fascinating. So there's been um, over 300 different genes that have been characterized or um, thought to be involved in pigmentation across mammals. Um, and so I would say in terms of horses, we know a lot, but we know very little all at the same time. Um, and so when I talk about pigmentation, I like to talk about it as it's a good cup of coffee, right? And so you've got your basis of what kind of roast do you want, a dark roast, a medium roast, or a light roast, and that equates to black horses, bay horses, and chestnut horses. And then from there, you can add cream or not add cream. But you can <laughs> add, there are like, you know, 30 different brands of creamers that you could add, and it's very similar to the different genes that can basically dilute that base coat color. And then from there, you can add your favorite part of the coffee or my favorite part of the coffee, which is the sweetener, right? <laughs> and so that's the white spotting. And so there are a variety of different sweeteners or a variety of different white spotting genes that you can add on top of that. So um, it gets complicated because each, you know, that roast, dark roast, medium roast, light roast, that's actually controlled by two genes that we know of. And then those dilutions, they're quite a few dilution genes that we know of. So for example, cream, dun, mushroom, um, pearl, sunshine. Um, and so when you're thinking about making predictions, you have to consider all of those things together. And then if we talk about white spotting, we have Tobiano, Sabino, Framovera, which we already touched upon a little bit, leopard complex spotting, um, splash white, uh, dominant white, uh, I'm probably missing a few, but, um, and, um, and so you have to consider all of those different things together to then make your prediction. Do you have a, um, as a geneticist, do you have a favorite color? Do you, is there one that you find the most interesting? Well, so going back to why I became a geneticist, right? <laughs> so my favorite would be Appaloosa spotting. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I guess my favorite would be a black leopard Appaloosa. Mm. Cool. Um, just because of the color is so spe spectacular or uh, looking at it from a genetic point of view? Um, uh, I, maybe both, uh, but <laughs> mostly because, um, you know, the first picture of an Appaloosa horse I saw was a leopard Appaloosa. And then uh, one of my... Uh, long time collaborators, Sheila Archer, she had a black leopard Appaloosa that I fell in love with. So his name was Leopardo. Um, and so that sort of fueled my passion for, for that color. Um, he, he, he's an awesome horse, yeah. Aww. Um, I have a horse that is a uh, rose gray. And as an example for our listeners, I'm curious if you can tell me what the heck is going on there and how that happens. Oh, yes, that's a, the gray is a, a sweetener I forgot to mention um, <laughs> in the coffee. So uh, the, the rose part comes from her base color, right? And so we talk about, you know, the roast of coffee. She would be a light roast coffee. She would be chestnut. Mm -hmm. And then on top of that, she has the mutation that causes gray. And so what gray does is it, they, horses with the gray mutation or the gray variant, they progressively lose pigment as they age. So when she was a foal, she was probably primarily all chestnut. And then over the course of, of time, she has lost pigment in her coat, which has caused her to be that rose gray. Mm -hmm. um, gray is dominant. Mm -hmm. And we also say that gray is epistatic, which means the genotype at that gene masks the phenotype of other genes. 
right? And it's because basically over time, gray horses gray out to the point that they're, you know, they have very little pigment left in their coat. And so oftentimes you can't always tell that a horse would be a rose gray because they have very little pigment left and you can't tell what that base color, color was. Hmm. That's so cool. And um, this is a question and I'm not sure if you can answer this or not. So, you know, either way is good with me, but um, it's, it sounds like some colors are, are connected to um, other things like vision, right, mm -hmm. or hearing, or all of these other pieces. So when it comes to a gray, um, uh, does its, its base color or its original color impact things like those other health things um, more, or would the gray pigment be dictating things like vision and hearing more? Or do we know? That's a great question. So the, the gray itself is, is actually the absence of pigment. So where, um, you know, graying, it's, it's like similar to graying in, in humans, right? In that, you know, the, the white hairs that come in as we age, it's because um, we're, as we're getting older, we're depleting our melanocyte population or our pigment cell population that um, contributes to the hair pigment, right? So graying in horses, it's similar in that the melanocyte population that is contributing to the hair gets depleted earlier. It, we think that the mutation that causes gray actually causes over proliferation of mm -hmm. the stem cells. And so basically they run out of melanocytes or pigment cells to, to cause pigment in the hair. But they also seem to have an over proliferation of melanocytes in the dermal layer of the skin and mm. that leads to melanoma. So mm. horses with the gray mutation are at higher risk of developing melanoma. Mm. And to go back to your first question about is there a connection with base coat color and increased risk? So there have been some studies that have shown that horses that are black and gray are at higher risk of developing melanomas than horses that are chestnut and gray. Interesting. Um, and then there have been other studies that have seen in, in different populations of horses that, that that may not be the case. And so it may be breed dependent or population specific. And so we, we have some work that we need to do there. Um, but we also uh, know, or what's been shown for the literature is that horses that have two copies of the gray mutation, so they're homozygous for gray, Mm -hmm. Those are the ones that are at higher risk for melanoma than those that have one copy. Hmm. Very interesting. So, okay. Uh, so that might mean that if you have, um, no, if you have two gray parents, does that always mean that you have two copies? Well, that's a great question. So you can have, because gray is dominant, Mm -hmm. You can have one copy of gray and be gray, or you can have two copies of gray and be gray. So theoretically, those parents could be homozygous for gray, mm -hmm. it, which would mean the, the offspring would be homozygous for gray. Both of the parents could be heterozygous for gray, which would mean the offspring might not be gray at all. There's a 25% chance, right? Because if mom was big G, little g, and dad was big G, little g, there's a 25% chance that both mom and dad are going to contribute the little g's. And then mom could be homozygous for gray and dad could be heterozygous for gray, at which point you would have a 50-50 chance of having a homozygous gray offspring or a heterozygous gray offspring. Mm -hmm. um, and so that would be a case in point of where genetic testing would help you make that prediction mm -hmm. with certainty. Interesting. It's all like super fascinating. Um, my understanding is that um, BLG contributes to just a lot of really important research. Um, is there anything that kind of stands out for you or something that you get really excited about when you're thinking about kind of current and past research? That is a great question. Um, I love research. It is really fascinating and fun and um, we have some really interesting projects going on currently. Um, so it's hard for me to pick just one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
um, but <laughs> I would say that, um, you know, one of the things that, uh, one of the projects that I'm, I'm probably very excited about is a project that is funded by Morris Animal Foundation, and it's um, to study um, the genetics behind equine recurrent uveitis. And equine recurrent uveitis is a leading cause of blindness in horses. And so um, I'm particularly passionate about that project because, you know, I want to save horses' vision if I can. So, um, or at least contribute to figuring out what is the inherited component of that so that we can help um, animal breeders try to breed away from that. And what we know at this point is that it, it seems like it's a complex trait, which means that there are probably several genes involved contributing as well as environmental factors. Mm -hmm. And when it's complex, it's harder to study because you know, there's horse to horse difference. So in this horse, these three sets of genes might be contributing to its inherited component of ERU. But in this horse, it's not the same three sets of genes. And so we've been um, working hard over the last couple of years. I have a PhD student who this is the, her um, PhD project. And specifically, we're looking at this in Appaloosas and um, related breeds. Um, so Appaloosas are eight times more likely to develop ERU than any other breed of horse. So ERU is the short name for equine recurrent uveitis. That's the problem with us geneticists. We like to talk in acronym. <laughs> um, so Appaloosas are at a, a, basically at a higher risk for developing ERU, and they're more likely than other breeds that have been studied to go blind from it. So mm -hmm. we, we, we really want to help to figure out why, what is, what is that mechanism? And so far, what our studies have um, shown, and we, we've just had a couple of publications come out recently about this, is that horses that are homozygous for the mutation that causes Appaloosa spotting are the ones that at highest risk for developing ERU hmm. within the Appaloosa breed. And so now the question is, is it the mutation that causes the Appaloosa spotting or is there something that is being inherited along with it on that same stretch of the chromosome? Um, and so that's, you know, really a, an area that we're working hard to identify. But also, it's not like, so horses that are homozygous for um, that mutation have a condition called congenital stationary night blindness. And that's a one-to-one -one correspondence. So horses who are homozygous for LP are night blind. Um, LP is, is uh, basically stands for leopard complex spotting, which is synonymous for Appaloosa spotting, if that mm. makes sense. So horses homozygous for the mutation that causes Appaloosa spotting, those are the ones that are night blind. Those are the ones that are at higher risk for equine recurrent uveitis. But not all horses homozygous for that mutation will go on to, be, to get um, ERU. Mm. And so that suggests to us is that there are other genetic variants that are contributing to that risk and or contributing to protecting a horse, if you will. And so that's another area of study that we're currently working on um, in the Appaloosa, as well as in the Canab Strooper and in Ponies of the America. Mm -hmm. So if you have a sample or a horse that has been diagnosed with ERU and you wanna participate in that study, um, we would uh, certainly um, like to recruit that sample. And how long would a study like that take? Like, are we talking months? Are we talking years? We're talking years. So that, that this has been a, an ongoing study over the last four years. Um, and um, my PhD student, Nicole Kingsley, um, has about a year left. So we're, we're hopeful over the next year that we're, we're really going to make a lot of headway with that study. Mm -hmm. Um, so people can get a hold of you and or, or not get a hold of you directly, but contribute in the same way that you were talking about earlier. Um, if they have a horse with this with this issue, I had a couple neighbors who their horses had night blindness, um, which uh, it's it can be traumatic for everybody involved. It's a really hard thing to manage and to find out with your horse. Um, what you guys are working on is really improving equine welfare by the sounds of things. So d did your neighbor's horse, horses have night blindness or equine recurrent uveitis? Uh, the night blindness, not ah, the, yeah. Uveitis. So the, the interesting thing about the night blindness um, is that, you know, what we've learned over the years is that some horses deal with it better than others. Mm -hmm. um, so I have a, an Appaloosa, he's a varnish roan, and he's 30, um, and he's homozygous 
for the mutation that causes Appaloosa spotting. And when we, um, working with Lynn Sandmeyer from the University of Saskatchewan, discovered that homozygotes were night blind, I started to manage him differently. Hmm. And so you're right, there is a connection with genetics and welfare. And so what I do for him is I have a solar powered light that basically turns on at night in his stall and I leave him in his stall at night. Um, and so basically, you know, it, it, I leave it a night light on for him. Um, and, you know, I'm gonna knock on some wood, but um, we've been really lucky and we, he hasn't had any, um, you know, major injuries related to not being able to see at night. But it's also been really interesting to watch him with, you know, his, um, I call him his stepbrother. I also have a gray Arabian, which is my husband's horse, but, um, he is boss horse during the day out in the paddock. Like he tells mm -hmm. that gray Arabian exactly where to go and how close <laughs> it can get. And as soon as the sun starts to go down, that gray Arabian becomes his best friend and becomes his seeing eye buddy. And mm -hmm. so instead of being boss, he becomes follower. And it's, mm -hmm. it's really interesting to see the change in behavior. Mm -hmm. Very, very interesting. Oh, Mira, I was, I was waiting for you and you were, you were waiting for me. Um, I'll go for it then, if that's okay. Um, so with regards, to, um, with regards to equine welfare, are there any other studies or any other research projects that um, kind of pull at your heartstrings uh, with regards to genetics and the potential impact or the impact on equine welfare? Um, I think the other project that kind of pulls on my heartstrings a little bit um, was the one that we talked about earlier about uh, the ocular squamous cell carcinoma. Mm -hmm. And part of the reason that pulls on my heartstrings was my dad was an oncologist and he um, passed away my first year of graduate school. Mm -hmm. And so I always wanted to do cancer research kind of in his memory. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, my connection with you know, studying Appaloosa spotting and uh, um, con congenital stationary night blindness um, sort of led serendipitously to studying ocular squamous cell carcinoma. I happened to be at a, a conference presenting on what we had found and a, an equine ophthalmologist, Dr. Mary Lasling, was there and she contacted me several months later and said, hey, would you be interested? I think I'm seeing an inherited trait in halflingers. Would you be interested mm -hmm. in studying this cancer? Um, and so part of the reason why it pulls on my heartstrings is it makes me still feel connected to my dad, um, wow. even though he's been gone for so long. And I also think that he would be uh, really proud of that study, you know? Yeah. Um, and so the mutations that we've identified so far in Halflinger, or the B mutation we identified so far in Halflingers and Belgians explains about 80% of the affected cases. So similarly wow. to what I was describing with ERU and Appaloosas, we think that there are probably other mutations and other genes that are explaining the other 20%. Mm -hmm. But then there are other breeds that are commonly um, represented with uh, or presented with squamous cell carcinoma, like um, the American Quarter Horse. And so we are working to try and identify what are the genetic mechanisms involved in that um, so that we can lower the incidence of the, of the cancer. Um, and also if we identify what are the mutations, maybe we can think about different treatments. Um, sorry, oh, you go I ahead. was just gonna say, for example, you know, um, halflinger horses that are homozygous for the risk factor, if they get uh, cancer in one eye, the likelihood that they're gonna get cancer in the other eye is higher. And so, um, you know, if they get it on their third eyelid, you know, do veterinary ophthalmologists decide that they are gonna um, remove the other eyelid prophylactically like what it's done in humans with breast cancer. Mm -hmm. um, and so those are just some things to think about. Interesting. Um, that paints a really beautiful picture of um, why this is so helpful to welfare and also why some of these research, ongoing research projects take so long. There are a ton of factors that you guys have to take into account and I'm sure things must come up um, as you're going too, hey? You're, yeah. you're constantly learning throughout these research projects. Absolutely. You know, when I started the Halflinger project, I thought, oh, we're going to find one mutation and it's going to explain everybody. Mm -hmm. And um, when we 
I, an undergraduate student actually did the sequencing for that uh, project. Her name is Jayan Liu, and she, um, super proud of her. She's in her fourth year of vet school now at, at Ohio State, so she's getting ready to, to finish up. But I remember vividly sitting down with her and looking at the data, and she says, oh, this isn't it, because it doesn't explain all of the horses that I tested. And I'm like, ah, but we have to remember this is cancer, right? So we're dealing with cancer, and maybe one mutation doesn't explain, not, you know, one, one size doesn't fit all. So, um, so we screened some additional horses, and, it, and that's when we realized that, okay, this is probably explaining a subset of it. Um, and, you know, and that opened up, okay, well, now we have a new question. Okay, these horses aren't explained by this, so what does explain them? A really complex um, uh, puzzle. The, yes. the whole piece, you're looking at all these different colors and, and pieces of puzzle pieces to put together, and it sounds like constantly finding new puzzle pieces <laughs> that you didn't realize were there before. That's what makes research so fun, right? Yeah. Because every answer leads to a new question, mm -hmm. which it's an entirely different question than you thought was gonna, it was going to lead to. So, yeah. Um, and before, uh, Mira, I apologize. I got really excited about this interview, so I just have some pummeling questions. Um, one last question for me, and then I'll. Um, but I'm curious about, so I've, I've um, looked at some research that might show that you can um, somewhat predict uh, through genetic testing the potential of athletic um, ability or tendencies, tend to, tendencies toward athleticism. Is that something that you've looked at or that you agree with or how much research is out there about that stuff? So uh, one of the first mutations that have been linked to performance in horses was termed the speed gene and that was identified um, by Emmeline Hill in Ireland. Um, and it, in that uh, variant, uh, does a good job at predicting whether a horse will be good at running short distances or long distances. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, her laboratory has done a lot of work in investigating um, additional other variants that are making predictions about um, whether horses are, how, how horses are gonna perform. Mm -hmm. um, there was a study published uh, this year um, by Annette McCoy and Molly McHugh that looked at um, standard breds because some standard breds are trotters and some are pacers, um, but they all are homozygous for the mutation that should make them pace or the permissive to gate mutation, which was discovered several years ago out of Leif Anderson's group. Um, and so that uh, prediction algorithm uses nine different variants to predict whether a horse will be a trotter or a pacer. Um, and I think, the, the biggest point or the best part of the answer probably is that as we learn more about horses and horse genetics, we are having a better ability to answer or start to answer uh, questions about complex traits. And so performance would be another complex trait where there are probably lots of genes um, contributing. Um, so there's been work uh, done um, by Dr. Molly McHugh's group and uh, Dr. Felipe Avila um, where they've been looking for what are called signatures of selection. Um, so what are the regions in the genome that are being selected for um, in different groups of racehorses? So interesting. Lots to research. Incredibly busy. <laughs> well, not all those people I talked about are here. They're all over the world, but I want to make sure I give uh, the right credit to the right people. <laughs> Yeah, lots of amazing work happening. It's a fun time to be in genetics, for mm -hmm. sure. Mm -hmm. um, was there anything else that your lab tests for that we didn't already cover? I think for me, one of the uh, sort of really fun parts about being the director of this laboratory is that we don't just test for horses. We test for about 25 other species. Um, and so when I became the director in 2017, you know, I am a horse geneticist, so I know most about horses. So I've, I've really had to learn a lot about other species, and um, it's, it's really, it's fascinating. Mm. So what are some of the other species that you test? 
uh, we test uh, dogs and cats and um, cattle and goats and pigs and uh, alpacas and uh, yeah, so quite a bit. I saw on your on the website that you also do some forensic testing. We do. We have a forensic section to the lab. Yeah. So yeah. So that's the real CSI. Is that is the real CSI. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then I also saw, which I found incredibly interesting, and I thought I might ask you about, um, uh, was it meat identification? Yes, we, we um, do do meat identification um, as, a, as a way to, you know, um, if, if someone is selling, this is pork, or this is solely beef and there isn't pork, we, we can test that and, and confirm that. Right. Um, the uh, forensic section of the laboratory um, does some really interesting cases and they're sort of the, the mantra for that is that you know we we get to we get to be the voice for the animal mm -hmm. um, and you know our uh, associate director of forensics um, Christina Lindquist she is uh, very very passionate about that um, and uh, you know that we have been involved in some really, really interesting um, court cases related to that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so that's sort of a, another exciting area, uh, com you know, uh, a completely different direction, although some of the cases that we have been involved in have been related to uh, identification of horses. Mm -hmm. um, and how do people learn more about um, about you, the work that you're doing, is there, do you guys have, oh, I know you have a Facebook page, and I know there's a website. I don't know if there's an Instagram page, so if you um, want to take a moment to self-promote, that would be oh, fantastic. Thank you very much for that opportunity. So we do have a Facebook page, and I guess I just, one of the things that I want to say about our Facebook page um, is that it was really, uh, came out of the fact that, you know, Genetics can be scary for people, you know, mm -hmm. and for me and the vision that I have for the laboratory is that, you know, the genetic testing we do is not going to really help that welfare component that we've been talking about unless people understand how to use it. And so mm -hmm. our Facebook page really got started out of our desire to find ways to reach people for education. Um, and so if you haven't followed us on Facebook, I would love for you to. Um, the Facebook page is um, just uh, facebook.com backslash ucdavis.vgl. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, most of our posts are really about educational pieces. Um, one of my favorite things that we ran, we ran a, a, a series of posts last year about two dogs that were bred and the resulting litter and um, just sort of teaching about dominance and recessive through that litter. Um, and that was really fun. And then we, you know, we run um, a series of posts called Coat Color Corner where people can ask questions about coat color and then we answer them. We have posts about, you know, research studies that just got published from the lab as sort of a way to say these are the things that we're doing at the lab. Um, and so that's why we have that Facebook page. We don't have an Instagram yet. Um, we have some YouTube videos. Uh, most of those YouTube videos are related to how to sample an animal and what it means. Mm -hmm. um, and then one of the things that I'm really excited about is that we are in the process of um, launching our new website. Oh. And the focus of the website um, really is on education. And so we've tried really hard to provide more resources and more tools. So um, what you'll see is um, with the, the te each test that we offer right now, if you go to our website, you can find the test that we offer and there's a little description. But we've sort of changed the structure of those descriptions to have a section that is sort of what I call um, get the skinny, right? Okay. What is the most important information for you to know about the test? Mm -hmm. And then we have another section that I call in the thick, right? And so that's where you're, there's a lot more details for those people that want the details. And so we're sort of hoping that that approach really helps from an educational perspective. And mm -hmm. um, we also have a glossary of terms. So we talked about a few of those terms today, but that's a resource that once we launch the site, people will be able to go back to and say, now what, what was homozygous again? <laughs> um, 
And so we're, we're really excited about that. Um, we're hoping to launch that in the next couple of weeks. Um, so yeah, those, those are the two things that I want to promote. Um, and then in, in terms of research, um, on, our, on our website currently, there's a research section and people can see what research projects we're working on. And our new site will have a, a, a much larger research section. And if anyone wants to know about the research projects or wants to contribute um, to the ERU study, you can always email me at research at vgl.ucdavis.edu. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Um, last little self-promotional piece. Um, if someone wants to get their horse tested, um, can you, do they just go to your website? I'm assuming that they get the information right there and it'll tell them a kind of step them through the process of how to get um, their horse's DNA out to you, okay? Yeah, that's a great question. So yes, um, they can order through our website and once they go online, um, basically they have to create an account to place the order, but there's a step-by-step -step process um, that they can go through to do that. Um, and then the results, uh, well, let me take a step back. So they can, they go online, they place the order. At the end of the ordering process, they'll get a kit number, which they would um, basically attach their hair sample to that and then send that to the lab and then results get emailed to them. Um, and then um, if they need help though with the ordering process, we have a great, great, great customer service team and they can just um, go through the website and there's a contact us, right? Um, and the email goes directly to our customer service team who help people place orders all the time. Um, and so really, uh, they're a great group there. And then also, if they need help ordering, they can always send a message through Facebook um, and we can contact people that way. Perfect. Mira, do you have any more questions? I don't. I feel like that was just so much information and thank you for just taking the time to explain all the different pieces. You've made it just really accessible for listeners. Oh, thank you so much. Um, I think, uh, well, is that a wrap? I think that's a wrap. <laughs> if you want more Friends on Horses, you can find us on Facebook at Friends on Horses Podcast. Check it out for all the latest and greatest horsey news. You can find us on the web at friendsonhorsespodcast.com or Instagram at friendsonhorses underscore podcast. Like what you hear? Help us quit our hate jobs by supporting Friends on Horses. You can support us by rating our episodes on iTunes. Becoming an ongoing sponsor through Patreon. Or simply by spreading the word about our show. Have some feedback? We'd love to hear from you. Contact us via email at friendsonhorses at gmail.com. Thanks for joining us. Until next time. <laughs>